Hey everybody, it's Dr. Jensen and welcome back to Media and Crime. We're in module one still. This is part two on predators, pictures, and policy. So again, this really moves into the Surratt text and uh, chapter one. So we're gonna go into a little more detail this time with some of these concepts that you will want to know so you can do your papers and assignments and quizzes and so forth. So let's jump in. Okay, so first of all, we have to go through the basic types of media content. They are these four areas, entertainment, advertising, news, and infotainment. And we're gonna present these to you, define them, and give you a few examples. Also, in the news area, we're gonna go through some different models and um, also newsworthiness. So we'll talk about that as well. But first, let's talk about entertainment media content. So essentially, these are vehicles for some kind of pleasurable escape, um, or amusement from everyday reality, or of voluntary exploration of a different kind of reality, otherwise not experienced. So, you know, you know, when you think about it back in the day, if we were reading the diary of Anne Frank, it's not a pleasurable escape, at least in many ways, but, you know, for many people, a book um, or, or looking at art was a way to kind of think about something different than what was in front of them. Um, so when we do entertainment media, we can look at things like print media, books, comics, playbooks, music scores, board games, something to present some kind of non-realistic drama, story, or alternate reality to us. And the more different it was from our life, usually the more interesting it was. You also have electronic media like movies, TV sitcoms, uh, dramas, video, um, entertainment games, streaming and social media. So I want to do a quick teaser. Obviously you know what entertainment media is, but um, this book will ask the question, and this class will as well, is there a CSI effect? So CSI was a very popular show for a long time. You can still get it on streaming service, and uh, people wondered if um, CSI would promote this idea that forensic evidence is always available, and we always have DNA to analyze, and um, it needs, it's necessary to get a conviction um, because the show was so prolific and pervasive in the social landscape. So this is kind of a teaser for a future module. We're actually going to consider the CSI effect to see um, whether or not it influenced actual crimes, cases, and trial outcomes. And we're going to look at the research to see what it has to say about that. So that's my teaser for later in class. But CSI would obviously fit entertainment media. We also have advertising media content, and a little bit further in Module 3, you're going to see advertising for different kinds of things. Uh, we have kind of uh, security cameras and those kind of things um, that are supposed to persuade you to buy it because it's playing on your vulnerability and your fear. You're going to be victimized. You need it. Um, essentially, advertising distributes messages geared toward persuasion, usually to buy something, to act a certain way. There's a call to action. And really, it's broader than the money decision focus of commercials. It has an impact on um, constructing the world around us and what our shared everyday problems, our everyday fears and vulnerabilities are. Um, it also can include political persuasion, um, as in candidate ads or issue-based advertising to start to say, let me tell you what the problems are in our social life and what the sources of those problems are and even some of the solutions. So it can be political advertising, it can be things like public service announcements, which we will analyze in this class, um, and also commercial or um, private advertisement for products and services. So there is some categorization fuzziness, and Surrett also identifies this in your textbook. So essentially, our public service announcements, like just say no, or take a bite out of crime, or crime stoppers, or stranger danger, your brain on drugs, um, the truth about nicotine, there's so many out there. Are these political persuasion or are they really, um, you know, agenda laden and so forth? Some people argue, yes, they are, um, but they're seen as public service announcements. They are given usually nonprofit status. Um, but again, a lot of political um, agencies have nonprofit status. So uh, we get kind of um, concerned about, is this persuasion really meant to get me to do something to be more careful, or is it meant to buy a product or have more faith in my local police, or you know what's going on here? And really, the editorial content um, is a political persuasion 
Um, and is it embedded in the news? And, and this is where we get into the argument of left-leaning or right-leaning news organizations. Um, we start talking about things like fake news and authenticating reality. Um, and some people will argue that the advertising content um, and that goes alongside major news organizations is very connected to the audience that it's advertising to. And, and you can kind of see this. Okay, so if you turn on the major networks like ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox um, that are widely available, you don't necessarily have to have a cable subscription to get them. Um, you can still get them in some basic form um, and even through streaming services on the internet. Um, these tend to have certain kinds of audiences, right? And then you also have the cable versions of these, right? Um, and then you have radio versions of these. And some of them try to be more centrist, others are more left, more right. But again, they're also juxtaposed by audience. So some appeal more to older generations, others to younger generations, or even political leanings. So we have to kind of think about this. And again, those ads are gonna kind of run geared toward that audience because now we can really market so distinctly to people. Um, that kind of segues into news media content. So we have our current objective of really obtaining factual information about real world events and by and large the news media accomplish this. How they do this with crime and justice is a different story that we're going to be telling in this class. Um, but essentially news and crime coverage has long been muddy. It's not always clear. And we have a big example of what we call le uh, yellow journalism uh, in the 1890s. Uh, so essentially this was newspaper coverage that was stressing really exaggerated accounts of, of real events, scandals, high sensationalism, and there was a real veering away from the truth. And so yellow journalism was meant to sell a lot of papers and get people to subscribe, but it wasn't accurate. It was perpetuating um, unclear things. And, and the courts started to kind of get involved with this as well. Um, Eventually, it steered a reporting shift in crime news from where the courts where facts are proven to police where facts are alleged or accused and they're in active investigation or processing of those facts. So instead of the reports being um, based on trials, we saw it kind of move toward these crime beats or these police beats um, where even just being accused could, could create stigma for somebody even though we had not proven that, that they had committed a crime. We also see this in the example of pretrial publicity, and this would not be an issue if the primary coverage were really of the trials rather than the events leading up to the trial. And when you think about this, all the coverage on a sensationalized crime story um, can really um, overshadow a trial where the public comes to a conclusion that your involvement with the crime is certain, and uh, being accused essentially makes you convicted, um, where that is not at all the reality. So we, we are gonna be studying pretrial publicity very heavily um, in modules four and five in this class to look at kind of how this shades our accounts of what happens in court. We also see the trial process screening out um, hearsay evidence, gossip, unduly prejudicial evidence, or illegally obtained evidence. So. All of this stuff plays out in the news media because it doesn't have the same criteria. It doesn't have the same boundaries or expectations that a court does. And it also doesn't have a judge out there calling balls and strikes and ruling out evidence or accepting evidence and making those discretionary decisions. So news media is very, very free to create whatever reality that it wants. Um, essentially, it's driven by this newsworthiness. So newsworthiness is very central to the theme of what drives news media. And newsworthiness is simply this, the criteria used by news producers to choose which events to cover. That being said, not all crime is covered because as you can imagine, most crime is property crime, like petty theft and so forth, or larceny, which is really boring to read or, or watch. And so they have to choose the stories that are most interesting, that are most newsworthy. Um, essentially, we also had an historical role of gatekeepers, uh, people that would kind of keep private business private um, because of power and access to things. And essentially, this created institutionalized ways of processing news through different steps before disseminating it. This is where we get sources for stories and we validate stories with editors 
before it's distributed. We also have layers of bureaucratic oversight in the newsrooms. We have fact checkers, we have corroboration of sources, which isn't quite what the courts do, but it's a step closer toward that. We also have desk editors and we have higher level editors that are there to print retractions or redact things that were stated and present corrections to stories. And so the oversight is really important here. And it's what allows news journalism to maintain its legitimacy. We also, um, at, at the time, had a slower news cycle. And really, we, to meet our, our deadline, we only needed to meet the publication broadcast deadline that competitors used to. But now that we're in a 24-hour news cycle, it's really hard to do this because there's competition on breaking the story and getting the, you know, bleeding leading edge of a crime story and the, the best facts. And, and there's an unsatiable appetite for this. And so, you know, back in the day, historically, it was a morning daily where you just had to make it for the paper the next morning, or it might have been the six o'clock news on the TV at nighttime. And so whatever happened after that would be tomorrow's story. But again, in our current cycle, we don't have the luxury of the daily news cycle or weekly news cycle. Now we have to think about this, um, especially um, when we think about the 24-7 phenomenon. Um, with newsworthiness, this really is about changes in news media that may undercut the criteria for newsworthiness because some of the less important stories get crowded out by the more important stories or the breaking stories. And my favorite thing to do is if there's a breaking story, they want to keep it on because, you know, facts and new information is funneling in. Um, but it's, it's really interesting to watch people um, stagger and kind of stall for time until they get new information because they essentially recycle a lot of facts and a lot of images and you get kind of bored. And you're sitting there trying to decide whether you're going to stay with a story or stay with the coverage. And it's hard because it's kind of teasing you, right? You don't know if it's going to get something new in the next 10 minutes or not. And you're just hearing commentary and regurgitation of what's already known, and it's frustrating. Um, and so again, these stories kind of get crowded out. And again, that 24-7 news dissemination is really due to the explosion of media, particularly cable news networks like CNN and different media forms, including social media. So that's actually what CNN stands for, cable news network. And Ted Turner at the time was laughed out of the room. People said, no one is going to want to watch news for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's no market for that. People like our current news cycle of daily or evening news or weekly news. They don't want to watch news all the time, every hour of the day. That's exhausting. But he's the one that had the last laugh. He essentially created an all news channel, 24 hours um, on a cable station, and it completely changed the news cycle itself. Um, we also have kind of non-journalists participating in this, like bloggers and social media users. Um, they don't have gatekeepers. They can take and use whatever they want. They can steal stuff. Um, it's very much kind of a black market or a black hole. Um, not a lot of oversight here. And so it gets a little scary and shady sometimes to look at what's presented there. We also have the new conditions of market competition for major news organizations. You have mergers and acquisitions of these news organizations. This group now owns this group, now owns this group. And so um, fast and first is a matter more than ever for profitability. We're eyewitness news, they're on scene, kind of all those kinds of things. They're trying to show that they are, should be your choice of, of, of news consumption. Uh, continuing on with our discussion on news, um, we're going to talk about three different models of news creation and newsworthiness. And these are documented in more detail in the Surrett text, but I just wanted to present some highlights for your notes. So we have the market model, the manipulative model, and the organizational model, and we'll go through these in detail. So first, the market model. This is really news as dealing in the marketplace of ideas. Um, so newsworthiness is really determined by public interest in getting those ideas out, again, ranking stories of which is most important or least important. And essentially, what you have is kind of just some objectivity in reporting real world events, um, but it presents news as really reactive. It responds to what happens um, and it's not as involved in creation of the story. So um, this is a very typical model that we see today. We also see the manipulative model, and this is where news is selected according to the interest of the owners of the news organization. So this is where we get some of those ideas of 
politically leaning news organizations, being further left or further right or centrist, um, being very guided by the editor in chief or the owner. Really the, the whole thing is this is purposive framing and distortion of events. And sometimes you get whole papers, you know, like um, the National Enquirer um, that kind of is created out of sensation. Um, the, the interest of the owner trying to get stories and get junk and garbage and gossip on people. Essentially, news is really proactive, proactively used to influence public opinion. Um, not a lot of people see as much legitimacy and accuracy in the manipulative model, but it is out there and it is consumed. You also have the organizational model, whereas news is processed to meet the news organization's needs. So it's not just the owner that's you know, making the call, but um, it's a little bit larger group. It's not objectively discovers like, like we saw in the marketplace model. Um, but it's formed by the organizational features to meet routine, um, the work routine of kind of when stories are developed. Uh, there is some tension here because news events themselves are not routinized. There is no routine to events as they unfold, um, but they're kind of shoved into this workplace model of getting stories out. So essentially the development of themes and the storylines helps routinize the coverage and make it cohesive for a workflow. So there can only be so many stories presented in one given broadcast or one streaming um, segment. So they, again, have to kind of use the organization's work routines and workflow to determine which ones are going to make the real. Um, also, news work is both reactive and proactive. Um, and there is some subjectivity here, but it's not always ideological. Um, sometimes we don't have enough to fill in the the real or the, the list of segments that we have. And so maybe we put in that human interest story, we put in that drama, we put in that thematic story, the story that's looking at um, organizational challenges, maybe it's looking at successes. And so you'll get kind of stories that you go, wow, it must be a slow news week. <laughs> it's that kind of a thing. Now we have a few modern challenges to news. Um, so certainly there are budget constraints, as you can imagine. There are fewer resources for direct coverage of events because you got to pay a reporter to be on the scene eyewitness at the time, as well as a, a camera person and, and a lot of other people to do editing. Um, so this creates more reliance on government and other organizations for press releases, which again really shape the message as to what should be released or what's confidential, um, what is, is considered intelligence information, not for public consumption, and things like that. There also is tension between that routinization and the newsworthiness. So again, routine crime is not dramatic and is not a moneymaker unless a frame can be used to enhance its appeal, where we can show someone as maybe a bad mother or a, um, a, a greedy um, owner, or you know, we put them in this kind of character form in, in some sense, um, where it starts to develop an appeal and, and we characterize the, the villain, or we vilify people, we, play up on the victim. I actually had a student do this in a prior class. They, they said, you know what, Dr. Jensen, sometimes when I watch the news and I see missing children's stories, I usually only see little white girls in those stories. And I don't see a lot of children of color and I don't see a lot of males. So what does that say about how we value children that are missing? We know children of all backgrounds and, and all genders go missing, but we don't often prioritize them in news stories. And and often um, there's been some writing research about this to suggest that, you know, for some reason, news outlets will value the innocent little white girl um, at the cost of others that also deserve attention to try to become found children. So it's really interesting to see this play out. Um, you also have new competition for market and profits. So new outlets are quicker and they're streamlined, but may not have those accuracy checks in place. And this is where you get kind of those YouTube channels um, and uh, where you're like, who's actually editing this? Is this a legitimate news station? Or is this just some dude in his basement that has some fancy equipment? I don't really know because they blur. Um, so we, we get kind of some of that going on too. And I call them kind of ro um, rogue outlets. Um, you'll get a rogue outlet that's trying to kind of compete for your time and your attention. Uh, finally, we're going to wrap up with infotainment. And infotainment is something that's going to come up throughout the class. So this is worth a few notes as we're wrapping up this lecture. So essentially, infotainment is the marketing of edited, highly formatted information about the world in entertainment media vehicles. So it's not entertainment, 
but it's not news media either. So it fits kind of this blended, um, this blended scheme. So some examples are like the Judge Judy trials, um, things like reality crime shows or cops, uh, political editorial programming like Rush Limbaugh or Sean Hannity, um, uh, John Stewart, you know, The Daily Show and, and some of these kind of things. Um, they tend to um, talk about real world events and consume news and show you unfolding scenes, um, but they're edited um, to be providing some level of entertainment for you. They mix features of reality with persuasion, um, with entertainment. They really sensationalize crimes, um, like our example of Nancy Grace. They often follow a formulaic storyline, um, like the example to catch a predator, which was very, very famous for a long time. They set the trap for the pedophile. They follow the pedophile into the setup. They let the pedophile incriminate himself and they film the capture. So it's sometimes, um, you know, following this, this method of how this, it's going to work out. And the same thing happens with Judge Judy. We're going to bring in the defendant and the plaintiff. We're going to read the storyline about their, their um, alleged suit or complaint. And then we're going to bring, we're going to swear them in. Then we're going to have some reporter commentary on it. Then we're going to bring in Judge Judy. Judge Judy's going to humiliate um, either side and call people liars and stir up some drama and then make a ruling. And it's kind of the same storyline every time. Um, the stories change slightly in the details, but the drama is pretty similar episode to episode. So infotainment can really blur fact and fiction and entertainment and news. And sometimes our ideas that we get about crime and, and what's happening in the world come from infotainment rather than news media, which is much more highly accurate. Um, and suddenly we go, wait a second, was that a Judge Judy show? Was it an actual trial? I can't remember where I got that idea from because of that blur. So we're going to stop here and uh, we'll continue with part three and we'll see you next time.